Uh, hello dear students, uh, welcome to another lecture in uh, clinical toxicology. Today we will be talking about toxicity by heavy me metals. My name is Maa Farid, I am a faculty member at the Department of Forensic Medicine and Clinical Toxicology at the Faculty of Medicine at Helwan University in Egypt. These are my learning objectives from this lecture. So uh, when we talk about heavy metals, uh, these are substances that uh, surround us in the environment everywhere. Uh, they are kinds of metals that have heavy atomic weight or high density over 5 grams uh, per cubic uh, centimeters. They are very toxic at low concentrations. Example for that will be arsenic, mercury, lead, iron, and cadmium. If you look at the periodic table, uh, these uh, are the metal, metals that are known uh, uh, in our uh, nature. And we today, today um, the highlighted one in red are the, uh, what are considered as heavy metals. Today, for the sake of this lecture, we will be talking about these elements, arsenic, uh, lead, mercury, and iron. There are some common characteristics of toxicity for heavy metals. Uh, first of all, they have double action. They have a local uh, uh, irritating action at the site of first site of exposure, which would be the GIT mucosa uh, for the digestive or the oral route, and irritation of the respiratory epithelium following, following inhalation of fumes. Uh, after absorption, they uh, uh, also exhibit a uh, uh, the remote action uh, on other parenchymatous organs such as the liver, kidneys, and the heart. Uh, usually symptoms and signs appear after a latent period following the exposure. Uh, also they have cumulative toxic effect which means they are uh, acute and chronic forms of toxicity. They have great affinity to keratin tissues so they are stored in uh, the hair and nails. And they also resistant to petrifaction. And this is uh, very important in forensic examination. So after, uh, if a cadaver is uh, examined after a very long time uh, of death, we can still find traces of heavy metals toxicity in the tissues, uh, even after a long time of petrifaction. They also cause uh, peripheral neurites, which depends on the type of the element. Sometimes it is sensory neurites, motor, or both. Uh, com continuing the characteristics, uh, there is a uh, high chance of by transformation, which would be uh, in the form of renal excretion of these uh, absorbent materials, or uh, what happens is gastrointestinal re excretion. Uh, it affects the sulfhydride groups and the enzymes uh, responsible for, ox for oxidation and reduction in the tissues, and therefore they are known as general for protoplasmic poisons, and I will be explaining this in a minute. Uh, when it comes to uh, management, uh, stomach wash is allowed in this kind of toxicity. Uh, there are general antidotes in the form of sodium thiosulfate, tannin, and charcoal. Uh, other specific antidotes is, uh, will be in the form of chelating agents, such as Demsa, Edita, Bal, and Penicillamine. And we'll talk as, about this um, later in this lecture. When it comes to detecting uh, heavy metal toxicity, we depend on atomic absorption spectrophotometry. Uh, one of the historical tests used to uh, diagnose the diagnose uh, cases of uh, heavy metal toxicity is a Rhinish test, uh, specifically for soluble inorganic uh, salts of mercury, arsenic, and antimony. Also, Marsh's test is uh, for detection of organic compounds of arsenic and antimony. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the mechanism of action, one of the mechanism of action of toxicity of heavy metals uh, is being um, general protoplasmic poison. So if we want to explain more about this uh, mechanism, uh, for example, if this is a cell enzyme it has sulfohydride groups, uh, it is responsible for converting the uh, reactive oxygen species in uh, the tissues or the cells into water and oxygen. 
if we have uh, if the cell is exposed to one of the heavy metals for example uh, lead what happens is lead will uh, um, bind to the sulfhydride groups of the enzyme uh, leading to inhibition of the conversion of the reactive oxygen species into the oxygen and water and this will lead to in, in, increase um, reactive oxygen species in the cells leading to cell apoptosis and death uh, to uh, overcome this absence, we use chelation therapy. So, uh, what happens is that uh, when I give a chelation therapy uh, or a chelation, chelating agent to, an, in, uh, to a patient with uh, lead toxicity, for example, the chelators usually provide the H group uh, and this will uh, attract the uh, heavy metal element. So, it will bind to the chelator agent instead of binding to the cell enzymes leading to uh, activation of uh, the cell enzymes uh, for oxidation and reduction, decreasing reactive oxygen species, and um, counteracting the effect on cell damage and apoptosis. Here in this uh, graph, you can see that uh, how the heavy metal cycles in the environment uh, from environmental exposure. It is uh, uh, worth to mention what are the common occupations associated with heavy metal toxicity. Uh, painters and um, uh, pottery, uh, manufacturing, uh, digital uh, electronics, manufacturing, uh, pesticides and farmers, uh, battery manufacturing, and uh, compassion of fossil fuels such as uh, in air pollution and smoking. These are some of the common sources or occupations that uh, are associated with heavy metal toxicity. Other examples will include smelters, working on uh, steel factories and um, uh, glass factories or glass manufacturing um, facilities. When it comes to the mode of toxicity, um, accidental um, exposure happens, as I mentioned, during uh, occupational, which is the most common, uh, occupational toxicity, because it's very common uh, elements in the environment. And usually this will lead to chronic form of uh, uh, toxicity due to the cumulative effect of, of these poisons. Accident also um, happened um, historically when uh, these uh, heavy metals were available in such uh, medical remedies. Uh, also suicidal, which happens when um, with, due to the easy access of these uh, products containing heavy metals such as pesticides and other environmental products, and usually because it's cheap and flavorless. Homicidal, uh, also uh, a common. Uh, form of toxicity uh, because these agents have long latent periods so usually the person who uh, causes the effects may, may be um, missed uh, it is odorous and flavorless so if you add the toxins to food or drinks it uh, usually the victim will not notice that and it has different colors so it is easily mixed with different kinds of food the first one we'll talk about in this lecture will be arsenic uh, acute arsenic toxicity, which uh, caused by an ingestion uh, or exposure to large doses of arsenic, which happens with uh, cases of homicidal or suicidal toxicity. Chronic toxicity uh, happens after small repetitive doses, as I mentioned, because of the cumulative effect of uh, heavy metals, which an example for that would be the occupational exposure. Uh, as we mentioned before, mechanism of action will include local irritation of the epithelium or the mucosa depending on the route of exposure, GIT or respiratory. Uh, remote uh, will, be, uh, will affect the parenchymatous organs such a, and uh, skin. Parenchymatous organs such as uh, liver and brain, um, kidneys and the heart. In this figure, you can see, or this graph, you can see different kinds of uh, arsenic. You can see the different colors. So uh, powders of these uh, different salts of arsenic could be added easily to different kinds of food. For example, the, the yellow one 
could be added to eggs or the red one could be added to other um, food with tomato sauce they will not be noticed by the victim this, they, this is why they are very commonly used in, suicide, uh, in homicidal incidents and um, of course white is easily added to different kinds of food um, so this is a raw appearance of different uh, salts of arsenic when it comes to the manifestation of arsenic toxicity, uh, basically it affects uh, every part of the body. It affects the nervous uh, system, leading to impairment of the me me mental activity, different kind of neuropathy. It causes um, heart diseases uh, in the form of heart uh, hypertension and heart attack. Also, also arsenic is uh, lead, lead to arsenic leads to different kinds of cancer, such as liver cancer lung cancer and skin cancer uh, kidneys may uh, might be also affected by uh, arsenic leading to kidney and bladder cancer uh, if it is deposited into the pancreas it will lead to the development of diabetes mellitus and uh, on in this uh, side of the graph you can uh, see the list of symptoms and conditions uh, related to chronic disease and acute disease uh, dermatological effects of arsenic is very common um, so uh, these are different lesions caused by uh, exposure uh, heavy exposure to arsenic uh, uh, for a long period of time you can see uh, one of them is a punctate uh, and diffuse uh, keratosis uh, usually affecting the different parts of the skin you can see that in the face in the hands uh, palms or salts. Uh, this one here in the forehead is called uh, Bowen's disease. Uh, it's like localized lesion in the skin. Uh, also, uh, when one of the um, causes of arsenic toxicity was being used in um, cancer chemotherapy, one of the cancer uh, agents that are used for treatment of cancer were. Um, uh, arsenic was one of the constituents or the active ingredients and they noticed that people who are receiving this who are receiving this medication develop a, a manifestation called knee line which is the whitish color of the nails as you see in this picture so this is characteristic with arsenic uh, chronic arsenic poisoning next we'll talk about mercury toxicity um, when it comes to the mood of toxicity, uh, accidental is very common. Uh, if it happens to be acute, accidental toxicity will lead to irritation and severe pain. Chronic toxicity will be uh, in the form of CNS presentations. Different compounds of mercury are available in the environment. Organic salts are one of the common um, sources uh, of mercury, of environmental mer mercury toxicity uh, because it is uh, used in pesticides and when it is released into the environment it contaminates different parts uh, of the food chain including seafood this is why we don't recommend seafood for pregnant women and infants um, because of the fear of contamination uh, or the fear of toxicity by contaminated uh, food with mercury any organic salts uh, use, are used in cosmetics disinfectants and explosive devices Metallic mercury usually uh, is used in dental amalgams and thermometers and some kinds of uh, vapor lamps. The mechanism of action, similar to uh, arsenic, will be in the form of lo local irritation of the epithelium or mucosa, depending on the route of exposure. It might lead to contact dermatites and it's very irritant, as I mentioned, giving a corrosive like action, burning sensation, and uh, lesions. Remote uh, toxicity will be in the form of um, organ dysfunction, especially liver, kidneys, and the central nervous system. And here are some examples where you can find uh, metallic mercury in the environment, so in thermometers, uh, dental amalgams, and this is a vape mercury vapor lamp. Uh, methyl mercury is one of the very common uh, contaminants of the environment. The reason for that, it is re easily absorbed into fatty tissues 
and it bioaccumulates in the environment. Uh, biomagnification in, uh, is one um, of the problems because it is uh, magnified into the food chain. Um, one of the major historical events the, where missile mercury caused uh, toxicity uh, in, uh, in, in a population in Minamata, Japan in the 1950s. It also um, was to mention that uh, cymersol is a different form of uh, mercury. It's called a mercury. It's used in um, several vaccinations uh, and it is uh, one of the controversial compounds that uh, people are concerned about when uh, receiving vaccination, especially for children. Um, and I would like to stress that uh, cymersol um, is... Um, has been used for decades in the United States in multi-dose vials. Uh, there is no evidence of harm caused by these low doses of cymersol in the vaccine, except for minor reactions, uh, such as the redness and swelling at the injection site. Uh, however, the Public Health Services Agency and the American Academy of Pediatrics and Vaccine um, uh, it's, uh, agreed that it should be reduced or eliminated in vaccination as a precaution. Uh, to guard against mercury toxicity. Manifestation of mercury toxicity, as I mentioned, causes uh, CMS manifestations in the form of headache, migraines, mineral loss. Uh, people may also complain of uh, vertigo, tinnitus, uh, depression, uh, chronic fatigue. It affects the um, lungs, leading to asthma and bronchitis, uh, anemia, because it affects the bone marrow, uh, it also might lead to infertility and Crohn's disease. So there are different uh, manifestations uh, affecting different parts of the body. You, you are not uh, supposed to uh, memorize all this. The, stun the things that I want to stress is the pink disease, which is a very common uh, disease in children. It is produced because of hypersensitivity or, or idiosyncrasy uh, reactive reaction to um, mercury exposure. Uh, one of the main manifestations is uh, acrodyna, which is a swollen and red, reddish uh, coloration and discoordination of the skin of the extremities with uh, altered sensations. Uh, other uh, included manifestation will include um, irritation, excessive salivation, tachycardia, and hypertension. And uh, this is differential uh, diagnosis for this condition is Kawasaki disease. Uh, also, uh, one of the characteristic uh, conditions associated with uh, chronic mercury toxicity is mercury erythism, which is a mental disorder associated with uh, behavioral pattern disturbance. Uh, it includes mood changes, irritability, uh, depression, uh, episodes of anger alternating with uh, episodes of apathy or loss of reaction. Uh, disturbance in the memories, disturbance in the sleep, insomnia, and other sleep disorders. Uh, mercury gingivitis is a very characteristic condition associated with chronic mercury toxicity, where mercury is re excreted in the saliva, leading to um, uh, gray linear pigmentation around the gums of the, uh, and the, the teeth. Um, it's also uh, mercury also leads to excessive salivation, uh, and this leads to inflammation uh, of the gum and gingivitis, and sometimes it's very severe, leading to loss of teeth. Now we'll talk about lead toxicity. Um, different uh, lead exists in the environment in different forms, in organic salts and organic lead salts. So the metallic lead. It's in alloys with other metals such as copper and tin. Uh, it's worth to mention that lead is a very um, commonly used uh, metal in different manufacturers. It's used in battery and electronic, battery manufacturing and electronics. It's uh, very toxic both in the gas and the solid form. Uh, lead salts uh, also is very uh, oxidized in soluble water uh, containing ammonia and weak acids. It is very commonly used in paints and pigments and any colored substance. Organic lead uh, in, um, also um, is found in gasoline, 
tetraacyl lead increases the efficiency of the fuel. It is commonly used in insecticides in the form of lead arsenate. And historically, it was used in some medical remedies, uh, such as lead acetate or sap acetate, which uh, was used uh, uh, in the past as ecobolic or uh, a substance that increases the contraction of smooth muscles. As previously mentioned, it's the, the mechanism of action includes also local in the form of irritation of the epithelium, uh, either the mucosa of the GIT or uh, respiratory system or the skin. Remote action, uh, action include uh, parenchymatous organs affections such as liver, kidneys, TNS, and bones. Uh, the route of toxicity uh, most common is oral, especially for soluble lead complexes that, uh, such as lead subacetate. Uh, if uh, inhalation of lead fumes leads to irritation of the respiratory systems, when it comes with contact uh, uh, through the skin, uh, it is easily absorbed. Um, if it is used as, um, if it comes in direct contact with the skin, or uh, maybe uh, uh, following unremoved retained bullets inside or shots inside the body, in cases of firearm injuries. Um, lead distribution in the body follows uh, the calcium metabolism is, uh, in, in the body, so it is stored in the epiphysis of lung bones. Uh, the deposition of lead in lung bones is increased by alkalis, vitamin D, and calcium-rich diet. However, mobilization of lead from bones uh, follows the ingestion of ammonium chloride, iodides, and parathyroid hormone. Lead toxicity uh, may occur due to uh, um, in the form of acute lead poisoning or chronic lead poisoning. Causes of acute lead poisoning will uh, occur due to overdose of lead containing traditional medic medications or uh, the ingestion or exposure to large amount of lead salts. Another cause for acute lead poisoning would be sudden deleading which happens after um, uh, exposure or uh, administration of uh, substance that lead to a massive demobilization of lead from the bones. And so the lead will be released into the bloodstream and leading to acute lead poisoning. Um, also, uh, another cause would be exposure to contaminated air with lead, large amounts of air contaminated with lead. Chronic lead poisoning, which is uh, more common, uh, happens uh, in cases of household exposure, industrial exposure, or absorption from retained shots or bullets because it is uh, it follows like um, exposure to small amounts of lead over a long period of time. Manifestation of lead toxicity differs according to the age of the uh, victim or the patient. For example, in children, we are very concerned about uh, the CNS and manifestation and the cognitive disorders by exposure, following the exposure of lead. Uh, in adults, we um, uh, are concerned about the CNS manifestation, blood manifestation, kidney manifestations, and um, uh, digestive manifestation. Manifestation of chronic lead poisoning or as uh, the, another term for that or another historical term for that would be plumism because uh, plumbers are um, commonly uh, exposed to lead uh, because of exposure to uh, the lead pipes uh, because of dealing with lead pipes so it was uh, defined as plumbism or uh, recognized as plumbism which, mean, which meant chronic exposure to lead poisoning. So the manifestation of chronic lead poisoning includes mental retardation in young children, uh, peripheral neurites, which is mainly motor, uh, affecting the extensor muscles of the extremities. And this happens due to demyelination of the axis of the peripheral nerves, which will lead to wrist drops or ankle drops, depending on the site of affection. It also uh, affects the optic nerve, leading to optic nerve atrophy. Uh, Burton's line, which is a blue line around the gums, uh, in the gums around the teeth, uh, which is related, uh, caused by a reaction between lead and sulfur ions produced by the oral bacteria. Um, one characteristic feature for chronic lead poisoning is anemia, 
and uh, in cases of uh, and it is diagnosed by blood smears where you can see basophilic stippling of the red blood cells this picture that uh, illustrates the shape or the manifestation of one of the common manifestation of uh, neurological lead poisoning such as wrist drop or ankle drop the blue line around the teeth in the gum and uh, when you do blood smear you can see the basophilic uh, stippling in the rbc's due to remnants of uh, uh, dna materials in the in the rbc's immature rbc's with remnants of uh, dna materials that is stained by basophilic stain another uh, heavy metal toxicity would be the iron toxicity it's very common in um, excellence especially in children mistaken uh, iron pills for candy and uh, following the ingestion of large doses of iron could be very very um, severe leading to fatal, uh, fatal incidents so the mechanism of action include local uh, corrosive effects on the GIT causing coagulative necrosis and the cause of this would be bleeding and shock. Remote manifestations of iron toxicity uh, includes increased capillary permeability, leading to loss of the plasma, decreasing the blood volume, and uh, the development of a hypovolemic shock. It also causes high, uh, cellular hypoxia with acidosis. And um, hepatotoxicity is a very common manifestation with iron toxicity due to the direct effect of iron on the mitochondria of the liver uh, acute iron toxicity has five stages the first stage would be the local git manifestation which occurs early after exposure due to the corrosive effect of iron on the mucosa of the git especially the stomach and the xenum uh, this will be manifested uh, with bloody diarrhea and sometimes uh, hematemesis Stage two, defined as the quiescent stage, where the patient shows uh, apparent recovery due to um, compensation of the GIT uh, manifestations. Usually, this stage uh, is from six to 24 hours. Uh, followed by the third stage, which is the systemic systematic toxicity, 12 to 24 hours following exposure, uh, the patient will develop uh, hypovolemia and acidosis manifested with pallor, cold, uh, cold extremities, tachycardia, tachypnea, and hypotension. Uh, the direct toxic effect of iron on the cardiac muscles lead to shock. The fourth stage includes the hepatic necrosis stage, where the port of blood delivers high amount of iron into the liver, leading to hepatic necrosis, and add more to the, metabolic, uh, to the acidosis through the metabolic acidosis. Um, the disturbed coagulation mechanism because of the damage of the liver and inhibition of the production of clotting factors leading to a more bleeding, internal bleeding. Finally, uh, the final stage with a very bad prognostic stage is due to uh, is the intestinal obstruction, which happens uh, following uh, about four to six weeks after exposure, and this is due to the um, uh, fibrosis of the corrosive. Uh, or the burned uh, mucosa uh, or in the GIT leading to pyloric stenosis and gastric fibrosis. Uh, we talk about management of uh, cases of uh, toxicity, which is a very common um, scheme that will help you understand the management of uh, 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 clinical toxicology cases. Usually think about 5S. The fight S stands for stabilization of the patient. Of the patient, this should be your number one priority when you are dealing with a uh, an emergency patient, or especially in clinical toxicology. And always remember that we are not treating the poison; we are treating a patient. So the safety of the patient is your number one priority. Second is followed by symptomatic treatment. Whenever you have symptoms, you um, try to treat these symptoms. Uh, third would be the stomach wash. If it's indicated or it's uh, available, you can proceed with this me measure. If it's contraindicated, you have to avoid. And it's very important to learn the condition where stomach 
wash is contraindicated in clinical toxicology. Uh, fourth uh, step is uh, looking for the specific antidote. And in cases of uh, metallic poisoning uh, or heavy metal toxicity, the specific antidotes will be the chelation agents. Finally, try uh, as much as you can to stop the further exposure of the patient uh, through methods of decontamination if it's available. Uh, speaking about chelation therapy, uh, for iron, chelation therapy is uh, of a choice would be diproxamine. For uh, lead, we uh, use usually EDITA or DEMSA. For mercury, it's a British antilovizide and the penicillamine also DEMSA is another alternative for, for arsenic and finally for arsenic we use um, BAL, penicillamine and DEMSA uh, I would leave these two topics for your interest if you want to elaborate and read more uh, arsenic gas toxicity and cadmium toxicity and these are my references and finally um, I hope you um, Enjoy the, this lecture and I am ready to receive any of your uh, questions. This is my email. Thank you for much, very much for your listening and uh, see you in other lectures.